we'll start out in Daniel 12 and we'll kind of move around a little bit. This may be the last one in this series. Might do more. Yeah, Daniel 12. Um, might do more if, if I feel like it next week. I, but I don't anticipate it. I'll put it that way. Uh, getting ready to be done with the series I did on Romans 9 and 11. That will bring us back a, a week or two after that to 1 Thessalonians. And we'll be, be dealing with the end times toward the end of that book. And so a lot of a lot of study on the end times to come. I don't want to be doing the end times twice at once, you know, having an end time sermon in the morning, end time sermon in the evening. And so, you know, I want to mix it up a little bit. But the Bible is about one-third prophecy. So I do want to preach on the end times about one-third of the time. Uh, I think that's purely biblical. All right. So in this series, go ahead and get to Daniel 12. In this series, uh, we've been looking at signs of the times. And uh, I've discussed, you know, people have always said, well, Jesus, Jesus is coming back soon. Jesus is coming back soon. And people get kind of antagonistic about that. Well, you know, you keep saying Jesus is returning in time and he ain't here. Uh, you know, is that even true? And people are doubting, losing faith. Christians maybe even are losing faith. And I'm sure a lot of people, Jack talked about people who set dates this morning in Sunday school. And all throughout history, people have tried to do such things. You know, then did you know the entire... Uh, Jehovah Witness cult was formed based on false prophecies. Uh, they had uh, the prediction of a date being set. And uh, actually, I think it's the, uh, what's that other one called? Uh, Seventh day of Venus. Uh, some woman prophesied uh, the return. I think that might actually be the one that was founded on that. The whole thing was founded on he's going to return at a certain time. And he didn't. And so they just kind of changed it and said, well, <clears throat> he's doing what's known as investigative judgment. You know, he's kind of figuring out who's worthy of this and that. And they're heretics. Anyways, it, it's false teaching. Are we in the end days? Are we in the last times? And I went through, the, this is the fourth sermon at least, where I've talked about different signs of the times, different indicators we can look at and say, we are near the end. We are in the last days. And actually, we, we need to look up our, our redemption is drawing near. Uh, and, you know, you don't got to take my word for that. That's why I'm going through the Bible and showing you different things that if you were discerning, you can easily deduce, we are at the end. There isn't anything left to happen. And tonight is going to be a rather interesting one. I'm not going to run through all the things I've been through already. Um, the, the main ones, though, if somebody said, well, what's the key thing I should look at to know if it's the end times? I would say Israel. Watch Israel. Watch what happens with the nation of Israel. Watch what happens when people say they're going to attack Israel. And right now, I've seen an article uh, this evening that said Iran was wanting uh, to go to war with the United States, and there's all kinds of things going on with that. Now, Iran and Russia has prophesied to attack Israel, and so it's very interesting what all's going on in the Middle East. And now, we, we see through it glass dimly. We don't see everything perfectly. We know the players of the game. We know, you know kind of where the pieces will be. We don't know exactly how everything's going to happen to a T. But when all these things are happening at this time, it's very interesting. And so the first sermon I did on this was on Israel, talking about how they are the fig tree and how a generation won't pass away after they see the formation of the nation of Israel. That was the first one I did. And we've done a couple more since then. And this one I want to try to cover two things. One is kind of the final one, and then one's a kind of added one that I thought was interesting. Uh, if you've listened to Jack teach Sunday school a lot, he, he's mentioned a couple times how technology is an indicator that we're in the last days. And that might seem kind of odd to some people, uh, you know, just saying that around, hey, you know, this technological boom that we've had is an indicator that we're in the last days. That's, a, that's an odd thing for, to say, but I want to kind of prove that to you from the Bible in case you're kind of interested as to why anybody would say that. So we're going to start in Daniel. We're going to look in Daniel 12, the very last chapter of the book of Daniel. And we're going to look at what it has to say about this increase in wisdom. If you look there, and I'll, I'll go ahead, I'll start actually. About verse, we'll just look at verse 2. I don't want to read everything. And verse 2 now is talking about at the very end of, of really the tribulation period here. It says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that, they that be wise shall shine as brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to that time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And that word knowledge, obviously, is also science. Uh, a lot of times
sometimes people misunderstand what science is. Science isn't theory. Science is fact, really. Science is something you can observe and prove. Uh, that's why, you know, there's a lot of good Christian ministries out there that call themselves creation science. But there's no such thing as creation science. You can't go back and test and prove creation. Science is observable, repeatable. Uh, you know, you, you have to be able to see it, demonstrate it, right? Science is knowledge. Science is truth. And there's nothing wrong with real science and true science, but there are false sciences. There are pseudosciences of our time. Uh, you know, as the Bible calls it, science falsely so called. And then there's the other understanding, you know, using the word science, using the word knowledge. We've been talking about the false doctrine known as Calvinism in the mornings a lot of times. Well, the early church talked about what God had was foreknowledge or pre science, they called it. And so if you read in church history, you read a lot of the early church writings. You'll hear the early church Christians would talk about pre-science. They would use the word pre-science, pre-knowledge, foreknowledge, knowledge ahead of time of something. Now, when Daniel uses it right here, he's saying that people are going to increase in knowledge. And, you know, there's a lot of interpretations you could take of that. You could say, well, that means they're going to know more about God. They're going to know more about Bible prophecy. But I think it actually got, yeah, sure of that. Surely we see even more clearly now the Bible and prophecy. But, you know, it is really interesting looking at technology in a more physical sense. Uh, satellites and all this kind of thing. Like I mentioned before, I have a cell phone there. It costs like $100 from Walmart a year ago or something like that. That thing, if you pay $50 a month, you'll get a signal and you can talk to people across the planet. And you can live stream video across the planet. You can talk in real time to people across the planet. And they can see you. I mean, that's an amazing thing. That's actually something that had to be fulfilled for Bible prophecy to, to be fulfilled. And that's that's one of these things that I'm going to prove here from Scripture. I remember, you know, when I was five, uh, my dad got me a Nintendo, like the first Nintendo that ever came out. And that was like an amazing thing back then. You know, probably was really expensive too. Dad was probably like, yeah, I got this thing. You know, it's like, it like the best gift ever probably. You know what I mean? It's just like when we get, you know, one of our kids a system, and they're like, oh, yeah, we got a system. You know, it ain't a big deal. But when we was little, you know, we got a system. It was like a big deal. Before that was like an Atari and I remember, I remember even playing an Atari. That thing had like one button, and you know, you moved it. I mean, it, but that was like an awesome game. And the kind of games that kids have today and all that, it is, you know, it's gotten crazy. At five years old, our kids were playing uh, on the Nintendo Wii and using a controller that wirelessly could, you know, imitate bowling or like tennis, you know, just by moving it. And the, the technology increase has been amazing. And like I said, not to mention, Wi-Fi, Internet, and the ability for high-speed data, all this kind of data, all this information, instantaneously traversing the planet from one place to another. And you say, well, how in the world does that fulfill Bible prophecy? Because, you know, you look at Daniel 12, it says knowledge is going to be increased. Well, what does that mean? At the time of the end, uh, as leading up to the time of the end, rather, there's going to be this boom of knowledge, an increase in knowledge, People are going to go all over the planet. There's going to be travel, I guess you could say, all over the planet. There's going to be people traversing the earth like never before. And then you're going to have a technological boom like never before. What would that possibly fulfill? If you want to, you can go to Revelation 11. This, to me, is, is really interesting. And I think I never did continue on. I was going to do a couple sermons, if you remember, on uh, raptures in the Bible. And I think I kind of proved the point in the first sermon and showing that, you know, the rapture is not just some weird thing that only exists in the New Testament. There's been multiple raptures. There is one rapture future, but there's been multiple raptures as far as being caught up in the air, being caught up and translated to heaven. We've seen Enoch and we see Elijah. Uh, we know Enoch walked with God and was not. He was translated. God took him. And I was looking at that, and I was going to do a few more. Well, here's another one. This actually is another rapture event of sorts. And it is the two witnesses in Revelation. Yeah. If you ever wonder, you know, who are those two witnesses? Everybody has their own theories. Nobody knows 100%. Everybody can make their guess. Who are those two witnesses? You know, I'll, I'll tell you mine. Jack can tell you his. Uh, my, mine has always been, and here's the two main ones. I'll tell you this. And I'm sure probably one of these is probably Jack's. A lot of people think it's uh, Moses and Elijah. Uh, that's what a lot of people think. That's probably the main view, Moses and Elijah. Now, they appeared with Jesus when he went to be tra transfigured, if you remember that, right? And Moses, and you say, well, why would it be Moses and Elijah as the two witnesses? Well, a lot of people think it is because they represent the law and the prophets, the totality of Scripture, right? 
And of all the prophets of God, those two are the leading prophets, you could say, other than Jesus, of course, right? And so a lot of people think that. I've always kind of thought it would be interesting if Enoch and Elijah were the two prophets because they had, they're the two that didn't really taste death. Uh, as we will. They had their own personal raptures, and, you know, that that's always been an interesting theory to me. I think it would be one of the two. It could be otherwise. The Bible doesn't explicitly state, and I'm sure, like I said, Jack probably had more to that. But that's not important for this. For this, I want to show you not only that they were raptured and show you that rapture event, but I want to show you how out of the prophecy and revelation it's necessary for the technology we have today to be in place. You see? So, yeah, back in the 50s, back in the 40s, you know, all throughout history, Christians have said, you know, Jesus could come right now. And here's the thing. Eminency is true. They were anticipating the return of Christ. That's biblical. You should anticipate the return of Christ. But if they had known more clearly these right. scriptures, these prophecies, they would have known, well, this needs to happen, right? right. This needs to happen. This needs to be. Or they would at least ask, how is this going to happen? Yeah. You know, is this an antichrist miracle that this takes place? Or, you know, what exactly is going on? And so let's get to it here. Uh, Revelation 11, verse 3. The Bible says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's 1,260 days. It's clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of, of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth the enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he, he must in this manner be killed. In other words, if you come up to these two witnesses and try to hinder them in their ministry, their preaching, or whatever they're doing, they'll just kill you. They will breathe, literally breathe fire on you, and you will die. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now, that right there would lead to Elijah, right? I mean, that's right there to Elijah. Elijah did the very same thing. And so that, that's why, you know, yeah. even in mine, I say Enoch and Elijah. I mean, you've got to include Elijah. That's very interesting for it to say that. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. Now, who did that? Moses. Moses, Moses. See? And so there's why the leading theory is Moses and Elijah, right? So you got Moses uh, doing essentially the plagues that happened in Egypt, and you got you got uh, Elijah who had the power to shut the heavens. And it says, And have uh, power over waters to turn them to blood, to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, that'd be an interesting power to have, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's like, well, I didn't get my way, you know. Here you go. Like, and, and at these times, you say, well, surely they won't do that. I mean, you better believe they'll do that. You better believe they'll do that. Well, God wouldn't want that, would he? You better believe he'll want that. You see, you can't downplay God's wrath and justice. And, you know, the same book of Revelation says when he turns the water to blood, he says, you know, they are worthy of it yeah. because they shed the blood of the prophets. They deserve it. And so the wrath of God will come. It is a serious thing, uh, you know, to, to, to act and, and to live the way that a lot of people are. And it's wicked now. And I did the last sermon I did was talking about, and even the one before that, the rise of iniquity and sinfulness. I might even talk about that here a little bit this evening. Is amazing in our day. The perversity and strange things that are taking place. It's very strange today, and it's rising, and it's getting to a fever pitch. It's getting to a point where you would have never thought it would have been this way. It's insane. You say, "Well, how in the world did it get here?" It's almost supernatural. It's almost like God has reprobated half of our nation. People are out of their minds. And surely it would be even worse in the final seven-year period. <coughs> and surely those people that come to try to stop these prophets or devour by fire, surely they're going to be pretty mad. They're going to be pretty wicked. And uh, so it, you know, that can kind of you can kind of let your imagination run wild with that one and how that's going to play out. Uh, we would be in heaven looking down at these kind of things. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that it, now here's the thing: God has a certain amount of time that they're going to prophesy, and when that time's done. It's like he lifts his protection from them and allows the beast to take care of Look what it says. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now that right there is a, is a cool verse. I don't want to go into too many little side things here. But a lot of times people will spiritualize away Revelation. And I talked. I mentioned last week how Ken Ham says, "Oh, you know, and, you know, the tree of life in Revelation, it, you know, it could be spiritualized away." But here's the thing: I don't think you should spiritualize prophecy in any case, unless there is a direct and real good reason to do so. You know, could it be symbolic? Is there a reason to take it that way? Now, you say, "Well, 
why would, why would we do that? It makes sense sometimes to spiritualize something. Well, here's the thing. Why did the Word of God say that this place is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt? You see? So when anytime the Bible spiritualizes something, now Israel, Jerusalem, is not Sodom and Egypt. But in God's eyes at that time, they were Sodom and Egypt. You see that? Yeah, right now, they're one of the most pro-homo uh, you know, nations on the planet. Uh, the gay pride parades in their streets, you know. And so in God's eyes, Sodom and Egypt, spiritually speaking. Yeah. But you see how it says, where are also our Lord was crucified. So it identifies the place and says spiritually yeah. this. Yeah. So don't don't let anybody tell you you need to spiritualize, you know, prophecy. It's all figurative or something. No, you can take it quite literally. Verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies. Now here's the key here. Yeah. So it, you say, well, who sees it, right? It lists it. Kindreds, people, tongues, nations. Right. Nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now, you know, like I said, you can kind of let your imagination run wild with this. But if you think about it, even as I think about it right here, right now, you know, why would they let their bodies lie, lie there for three days? Now, we know there's all different kinds of customs Jews have, and you can argue... You know, they don't want, you know, want bodies to lie there dead or maybe they're doing it to disgrace them. And I'm sure people have all their different theories. But what's interesting to me is, you know, I'm just saying this as, as I speak, as, you know, as Paul would say, I speak as a man. You know, I'm just saying what makes sense to me, if somebody was breathing fire out of their mouth, killing people, I'm not going to be the first one to go over and pick them up. You know what I mean? And so in a way, I'd say most people were still kind of scared of this and, and kind of like cautious as to what's going on. And it took the devil incarnate himself to kill them. And so they lie there for three days. And look how the people react to this in verse 10. They that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Now, it, basically a holiday is put in place. Yeah. You know, a worldwide holiday for the prophets being killed. You know, who knows what it would be called. But the whole world celebrates this. Why would they celebrate it? They've been tormented by these people. They've been closing up. The, there's no rain. There's famine on the earth. Yeah. They're killing people with fire, you know. Somebody's daddy went there to try to kill the, these people, and they killed their dad. And it, there's wrath from these people. There's anger. There's hatred. There's confusion amongst the people. They're like, who are these people? You know, I was, I was mentioning that earlier. Most people these days that are young, they're not even taught the Bible anymore. They don't even know Jesus. And so imagine in the last days how much worse, you know. Imagine 10 years from now, 20 years from now, however long it takes for the Lord to, to do these things. Imagine the confusion on people. They're not going to know these things. You know, if this happened 50 years ago, most people in America were pretty literate back then, yeah. biblically. Most people knew the Bible on, on a pretty good uh, level. Uh, that, that's why a lot of times you go to good churches, they're generally older, older people in the pews. Younger churches are ones that's firing into deep Calvinism and weird stuff. The older churches are independent fundamental Baptist churches in, in general. And so, you know, in that last day, most people are not Christian. Most people aren't going to be like, hey, look, that's the Antichrist doing that. Hey, look, that's the two prophets. They're not going to know the Bible. They're not going to know the Bible at all. Verse 11 says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. They stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw, yeah, boy. saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither. And they ascended the, up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Yeah. That would be why I was talking about their own personal rapture. They have their own catching up there. So they, they rise again to life, and he says, all right, come up here. And following this, you have, obviously, more judgment and wrath from God. And so in this, you can see very clearly, not just that personal rapture event here, but I'm pointing out here specifically, when you look at verse number, I think it's um, 10, it says, they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice, right? Verse 9, they, the people, the kindreds, tongues, and nations, the scope of this is what I would call it, is worldwide, and they're all watching. You know, no, the world ain't watching me right now. I promise you that. You know, at best, I might have five people on the best day streaming <coughs> that's going to watch me live on Facebook or something. You know, the best video I'm put on YouTube will get 100, 200, a couple thousand views of the best videos I put on there. But at this time... Everybody's watching it. Everybody wants to see this. And you can understand that from any tragedy that happens. Everybody watches the news. 
and hurricanes going to come. Everybody's watching the Weather Channel. You know, a shooting happens. Everybody's watching, you know, with their favorite news station. And how much more, when these actual miracles are taking place, everybody's eyes are glued on the TV. And so this is something that God does that everybody can see. Now, the thing is, when could that possibly have happened? When could that possibly have happened? Well, was, was God going to open a portal up in, in everyone's front room where they can see a vision of some kind that these, these events happening? No. So very clearly, there must be technology in place for the whole world to witness these events. Can you imagine, you know, the, tele, the, the, the reporter there with a camera, you know, videotaping the people rising up? I mean, it would be amazing to see. And certainly, it's going to cause a lot of shock and wonder for the people at that time. You know, and, and here's the thing. I think technology right now can be used for good and bad. Yeah. And so we need to learn how to use that technology that God has given us. I believe it is from God. Yeah. God. God has, in these last days, enabled man to come across these things. He's already put it in man, to the ability to gain wisdom and knowledge. And he, he's, he's given man these great techno technological advances that I believe can be used for good. And we're even trying to do that now. Uh, the reason we record these things in the morning and the evenings, putting them on there, and there are people, not a million people or nothing, but there are people that will hear the word of God and they respond to it. And so that's a blessing. That's something good we can use. But Satan's going to use it too, you know. Yep. Um, and so, you know, be careful of all the, the different ways technology can, can kind of hinder you. I want to mention one more thing here. That will cover uh, sufficiently proof that I think technology is a sign of the times. Go with me to Luke 17. I was going to do a longer sermon on technology and talk more about it. I think that proves the point, though. Yeah. I think that's kind of like, you know, the nail in the coffin. There's no arguing that point. The whole world watches. Technology has to be at a certain place for the world to, to you know, enter into the last days. This is something that I think is kind of interesting because this describes people during the tribulation period. This describes people who are going to be on earth yeah. near the end of the tribulation when God comes back to set up his kingdom. Yep. Now, obviously there's a time gap there, so we can't look at behold them there, but you know, at worst we're looking at a, a couple months to years where we would be engaging with these very same people. And so what I'm telling you is planet earth a couple years into the tribulation is very similar to planet earth a couple years before the tribulation period. And so these can be indicators to us of what it's going to be like. Who, what are people going to be like during the tribulation period? What is the world like at the time of the tribulation? Because if you know what it's like during the tribulation and how people are then, you're going to know what, you know, well, we're getting near it, right? And so let's look at this together. Luke 17. I'm going to start at verse 20. Luke 17, verse 20. This is the, I called Jack and talked to him about the latter half of this. I'll explain something in brief to you uh, when I get there. Because some of these things can be confusing to people. I remember my, my dad now said, you know, I, he was talking about how he used to confuse the rapture with the second coming. And a lot of people do that. The rapture is not the second coming. The second coming is when Jesus steps foot yeah. on the Mount of Olives. Yeah. That's in Zechariah. The rapture, Jesus doesn't come back and, and touch planet Earth. And so this here is his second coming. This here he's talking about when he comes and sets up his kingdom, okay? Right. Totally different than the rapture. Look with me here. Verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now that word, I looked that up here. When he says within you, he's basically saying, In your midst. It's here. Here it is. In your midst, within you. That word translated that way can be translated, it's here, right? In your midst. Uh, it's not saying it's in your heart and it's not teaching homilineal theology, but that's a whole other story. He's saying the kingdom is here. The kingdom is with you. The kingdom is here. And he said unto the disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them nor follow them, for as the lightning that lighteth, uh, lighteneth out of one part of the earth under heaven, of one part of under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And, it, and here's, the, here's the key here. 
And as it was in the days of Noe, that would be Noah. You say, well, why does it say Noe? It says Noe because that's Greek. The Greek is translated over into English. And the Greek, by the way, was just the Greek version of the Hebrew. So Noe is Noah. So shall, it also be, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Well, what was it like in the days of Noe or in the days of Noah? He says in verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noe entered in the ark and the flood come and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day, Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Yeah. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I like that word reveal there. That's what Revelation is talking about, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of him, right? So it says, so shall it be the day when the Son of Man shall be re is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down and take it away. And he is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. There's so many different things you can teach out of this. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. They answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be yeah. ga gathered together. Yeah. Now here's the thing, and it go down here and uh, another way is a vultures, basically for eagles. You say, what is that? Eagles, yeah, it's vultures. Yeah. You say, now, flip with me. I can hold one hand. You don't have to. If you just want to listen, you can. I'm going to read this out of Revelation really quickly here. <clears throat> this is Revelation 19 here, yeah. verse 21. The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the Fowls were filled with their flesh. Right? Now I'm going to flip over here to Matthew 24. Now this is in my notes or anything. I'm just going to show you real quick. This is what I discussed with, with Jack. Just kind of make sure I wasn't flying off the, the deep end or anything. you know, Because it can be confusing. Matthew 24. In case you're confused about Matthew 24. A lot of people think he's talking about the rapture here. He's talking about the second coming. I was confused on this at some point. Yeah. Because it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, you say, uh oh, that's when the rapture is. But that's not the rapture, it's the second coming. Right. Look what he look what he does here. Verse 27. Okay. Matthew 24. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man, the, of the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered yeah. together. You see yeah. that? Now, Luke 17 is not Luke 21. This is a whole other time. This is a whole other instance of this. So what is this? What's going on? God gathers together this gigantic flock of vultures, of birds, to feast on the dead bodies right. of all the people he kills after the Battle of Armageddon. That's what this is. And so the same thing that he's talking about in Luke 17 is that. Yeah. And that's what he says. Look back in Luke 17, verse 37, just to bring it full circle. They answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? What's that question? That question goes back to, Where are those people? Look, look in verse um, 34. I tell you, in that night there, there shall be two men in one bed, one taken, the other left. See? Two women shall be grinding together, one shall be taken. Now, I was talking to Jack, you know, I've heard so many preachers, they'll say, you know, that this is referring to the rapture. That one will be in a field, they'll be working together, and then one person is raptured away. And it sounds right, it sounds like it fits, and it can be applied in that sense, but this ain't what that's talking about, because if you put it in the context, it has to be referring to his second coming, yep. the very end of the tribulation period. Now, people who deny the pre-trib rapture, they use this as ammunition. And so, you know, knowing both sides, I, I actually come at this, and I can, I believe I'm able to see and, and to kind of discern where people are messing up on this and why, you know, it's kind of like an open hole to, to just, you know, to attack. And so if you, ta if you take these verses to refer to the rapture, then you're, you're basically giving credence to people that believe in the post-tribulational rapture, I believe. 
So what he's talking about is people are taken in judgment. And there's other verses I could show on this. It's not the purpose of me going here. I just found it really interesting. There's other verses I could show on this where it talks about, you know, gather them uh, into my barn, gather them to be burned, you know. And where it talks about being taken in judgment, taken in wrath. And specifically in Matthew chapter 25, right after he talks about what I read a while ago, Matthew chapter 25 talks about the sheep go judgment when many people are thrown in hell. And only the believers go into uh, the millennial kingdom. And those believers, that's who populates the earth. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of teaching to do there. And unfortunately, it's not the topic of this sermon. But I did find that really interesting. Now, here's what I want to kind of focus on really quickly, and then, then we'll close here. I want to look at this part here. There's two things, really th three things, but there's two things he points out and says that in the tribulation period, because we know we've pinpointed we're in this seven-year period, and we've pinpointed this is happening at the end when he gathers the birds to, to come eat these dead bodies, right? So we know, we're, we know where we're at time-wise. We're in the tribulation period. We're in the Daniel 70th week. So during this time frame, leading up to his coming, what are people going to be like? You see? So this will let us know, okay, people are like this at the time of the end. Now, what I would say is, are people like this now? Is the world like this now? And if it is, it must be near the end. Because that's the way they are in the tribulation period, you see? Now, note first, look here. It says, verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah, or Noah. And he, he lists and he says, they ate, drank, married wives, were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, the flood came and destroyed them. And I think you really, what you're getting here is you're getting two different illustrations of the rapture. It's really interesting. And number one, Noah goes in the ark, then God's wrath comes, right? Number two, Lot he gets rescued by the angel, then God's wrath comes, right? So the angels rescue Lot and his family, then God's wrath comes. Uh, Noah gets in the ark, he's protected, he's safe, then God's wrath comes. Both of those are very interesting descriptions of the people of God being protected from the time of God's wrath like that. Now, the other thing I'd point out is this, verse 27. It seems like he's saying people are just going about their lives. Doesn't that sound kind of, well... People marry. You, you're sitting there saying, well, I got married. You say, well, people are eating. I eat food. How in the world is that an indicator of the end of the world? You know what I'm saying? Here's what he's saying. People are just ignoring the things of God. They're just going about their life. You know, and it, it's amazing to us, right, because we know the Bible. We know God's Word. We know prophecy. It's amazing to us to say, how on earth could these things take place and people not realize they're living in the time of the end? These people don't know the Bible. Well, it must be the time when people don't know Scripture. That's these days. We're in those days. People are ignorant, man. People don't know. People don't know very much these days. You you, can, you say, think in your mind the easiest Bible doctrine, the easiest one. Just think. Well, this is the easiest. This is so easy to get. You know, Jesus is God. You know, that's so easy. A lot of people don't know that. Or you just think, okay, God created the heavens and the earth. A lot of people don't believe that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Just think of the easiest thing. People don't know it. People don't believe it. People have never heard it. And at this time, they're ignorant of God's word. They're going about their lives like everything's normal when everything around them is going to pieces. That's exactly the days we live in. The world's going, going to hell in a handbasket. Everything's falling apart. The families are falling apart. It's, it's unreal. I, you can look at statistics of these countries overseas and something like 70-some percent, 80-some percent of some uh, children in these countries are born uh, basically as bastard children with no dad out of wedlock. I mean, it's, it's staggering. There's, there's movements now. Uh, they call it men going their own way. Entire movements where men are saying, I don't want a woman. You know, and <laughs> with the way women are so these days, I don't blame some of the men, you know what I'm saying? But it's good, isn't it not, to have a family? It's godly, it's right. And there's movements that are totally antithetical to what God's word says. In these days, they don't care what God's word says. They just go about their everyday life. And here's the <laughs> other one. This is the other one that's fairly interesting. It says, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. Well, where did Lot live? Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He lived in Sodom. Now, does our country look a little bit like Sodom? Yeah. I can think of the LGBTQYZ people that would have my YouTube shut down if they know what I even said on there so far. It'd be shut down. I'd be banned off Facebook off of sermons I preached on homosexuality. You can't have free speech. You can't, you can't even speak a word against that. 
That is, that is, and you have preachers that are coward, being cowards about it. And uh, I heard some good preachers say they're legislating immorality. They won't even say the words. They won't even say the words homosexual. Mm -hmm. The immorality. Nobody knows what you're talking about when you say that. Unless, if the men of God don't get up and call things what they are, you know, people will perish for lack of knowledge. We, we need to speak of things clearly. <laughs> and in these days, at the end of the world, it's going to be just like it was in Sodom. It looks like that in America now. It looks like that in Canada. It looks like that overseas. It looks like that in Revelation when he said that Israel was spiritually Sodom and Egypt. You see? So, you know, you might ask yourself sometimes, what's up with this explosion of just weird sexual perversion? Well, it seems to me, like in prophecy, that's an indicator uh, that we're in the last days. Yeah. It's not ever been, you say, oh, people have been homosexuals throughout history. Not like this. Right. There's not been a society that said they, they are marrying. They've redefined marriage. And they're seeking to do it across the world. It's never been like this. You can't tell me that. You don't, if you say the world has always been this way, you don't know history. You've never studied it. If you think that Christianity or some cult version of Christianity or the world has ever, on, in any, you know, yes, there's been a small village of weirdos. But it's never been the whole world. For it to get like this, it's a sign of the times, man. And that's what Jesus says. He says, hey, it's going to be like the days of Lot. And then he goes and he gives more examples saying, guess what? They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. They just went about their lives. They don't care. You know people around you that don't care about the Bible? You know people around you that don't care anymore about God's Word? They're just so, it's like they're dead to it. It's, it's like they're paralyzed to the things of God. It's like you'll say something about church or about God or His Word or we need, why don't you come back to church with me? Why don't you have any zeal for God? Or why don't you ever read your Bible? It's just like falling on deaf ears. I, I've had people, I'll say this, I've had people that know who I am. They know that I'm a preacher, okay? They know that I'm a Christian, more importantly. And they will say and act in ways they know that I think is reprehensible to me. I'm not going to describe it. It's a, it's a shame to say and speak of some of these things. I can't do it, especially from a pulpit. But they'll do that. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, what are, you, what are you thinking? I'm not going along with this. That ain't funny to me. I'm not five. Why are you speaking and talking these things to me when you know I hate that? They don't care. Their, their brain's off. It, it, they're, they're so used to being perverted and so used to being strange and, and, and evil that they're just like putting it on you. They don't, they don't care. You say, well, used to, people respected Christians. They wouldn't act and look at a certain... They would, people used to want to even dress in a way that wouldn't offend people. Think of that. My goodness, how far we've come from that. Now you can't even get on ESPN.com without there being a naked dude. I'm not kidding. A naked dude on the front page of a website that's supposed to be about sports. It's, it's gross. It's sickening. But that's the way our culture is today. Just cramming filth in your face. Just cramming it down your throat. There's no respect for Christians. There's no respect for God, more importantly. They don't care. They're just going about their lives. Indulging the flesh. Indulging perversion. Indul indulging immorality. As much as they can get, they're just you know warfing it down. They don't care. And in the time of the end, that's exactly the way it's going to be. Sodom and Gomorrah, were they were full-blown gone, dude. They were gone. That's why God torched them. You say, well, how could God ever, like the, the plagues in Revelation are, are extreme. That what he does to the earth, the things he does to the people, that's extreme. Why would God do that to people? They're like Sodom and Gomorrah. They're perverse and strange people. That's the times that we're living in, man. I honestly, it can only get a little bit worse. The only way that it can get worse is if they start kicking in the doors and coming in here and handcuffing me. And it ain't far from that. It's a criminal offense. Things I've said already in this sermon is a criminal offense overseas. That's no joke. I could be literally charged with crimes. I'm not kidding you. That's how close we are, guys. Yeah, it ain't popular. This, this church here will never be full. It don't shock me. It will never be full. Mark my words, never be full. Not because God don't love people, but because we're getting near the end. Because people hate the Lord, because people are full of evil, because we're getting closer and closer to that time. I hope people get saved. I hope I'm wrong. But I, I know the people. I know the hard hearts in our area. This isn't, you know... 
Phoenix, Arizona, or something where, where they say, this is a right place. There's two million people around you. Plant a church there. This ain't it. This is hard-hearted. Heard the gospel 495 times growing up. Rejected the Lord living in, you know, drunkard immorality. Big Stone Gap. This is Big Stone Gap. This is the place where heroin and meth and drugs and drunks come to adulter and sleep around as much as they possibly can and hate the Lord and ignore him and, and at the same time give him lip service and say, I believe in God. That's the town we live in. Yeah, I hope God does not work. But man has a responsibility. And this right here, this tulip junk, that ain't true. So God ain't going to force nobody to be saved. He ain't going to come and just, you know, hey, you're saved to me. You don't, you don't even have to believe in Jesus. You're already regenerate. Oh, now you'll believe guaranteed, though. This, this whole doctrine of Calvinism, it, it's, it's baloney. It ain't going to happen. It's on us to preach the word. It's on us to teach people the truth. And then it's on them to respond. Now, I'm going to tell you, people ain't responding around here. And in the end times, it doesn't seem like many people respond either. Now, there is an explosion, I would say, of salvations during the tribulation period. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people that get saved from the Jewish evangelists. And that's, if you want to look at that a little bit, read Revelation chapter 7. Yeah. Okay? Uh, 14 talks about it too a little bit, but really chapter 7 gets into this great multitude that is coming into heaven through the preaching of, uh, of the 144,000 Jew, Jewish evangelists in Re Revelation 7. You can look at that. But I'll, I'll close here. This is what I'll say just to end this. Maybe I'll do another one in this series. Maybe I won't. You know, what, what should you take away from this? What's the purpose of preaching all these sermons? Why do I even go through this? Well, number one, it's interesting. I love it. I think it's interesting to know we're near the end. It's interesting to know that this book is alive, it's true. It's predicting literally the things that are going to happen. It's an amazing thing that you have a book that's supernatural that's like, hey, this is going to happen, and we're living in it. It's amazing to see that. But number two, even everybody in the pew, it, it don't matter, and everybody that hears this on the Internet, they need to, you know, the, the, Romans, I think, says that you need to look up your redemption draws near, that it's nearer than when you believed, that it, to awaken out of your slumber. And I think there's a lot of Christians that are, that are slumbering. Yeah. They used to do better works. They used to do more for the Lord. They used to open up their mouth a little bit more to their family members and their friends. They used to give out church invites a little bit more. And, the, and you know, the Bible says in Matthew 24, because iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. And don't let that be us. Don't let it be. It happens to me. It's going to happen to you. You're going to see wicked people. They're going to be evil to you. They're going to backbite you. They're going to harm you. They're going to steal from you. And you're going to say, I'm done with you. They're going to reject the Lord. You know, did you get this? Understand this. If you witness to somebody, they're not rejecting you. That's right. They're rejecting God. Yeah. Not, I mean, don't take it so personal. I don't. I don't take it personal. When I try to witness to somebody or I talk about God to them and it's just one ear out the other, I'm like, man, it ain't me to reject them. Because if they do better, they say, here's what I wish they'd do. And this might sound weird, but I wish they'd, I wish they'd say, Charles, I don't believe you. I'm going to get a Bible out and see. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because what I believe comes from this. And if I'm wrong, I'll change my mind if you show me in this book, you know? I wish they would say, I just don't know if what Charles is saying is true, and just open this thing up and see, you know, when I got saved, when I got right with God, when I started doing things for God, when I started reading his word, I said, man, this ain't hard to see. It's right here in black and white. And it ain't, it, you ain't got to be special and elect to see it. You just, you just got to be honest and contrite of heart. And willing to, you know, bow your knee to the Lord and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Show me, show me what this book means. Show me the truth, and he'll do it for you. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and your truth. We ask, God, that you would do it work in our time. Yeah. And I, I do want to see more people saved. But, God, it's not surprising to me that so much truth and so much teaching falls on deaf ears. And so many people are hard-hearted and will not get back in church. We will not go to church to begin with. May you work through us. Give us perseverance and patience. Give us uh, some comfort. And God, we just love you and your word. We thank you for another good evening study in your word. As we go forth here throughout the rest of the week, may you be with us and bless us and keep us. And God, we, uh, we love you and thank you and praise you above all else for your son dying for our sins and rising again for our justification. We love you and praise you in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.